The Mayor's Public Space Charter should empower communities to deliver public space. The problem with an increasing reliance on private companies to create public realm is not solely about permissions and use. It's also about siting and scale and a focus on new spaces without addressing how we improve our existing public realm. This is a photo of a recent Peabody development near where I live. And for me, this illustrates the issue quite well. The city gets discrete fragments of space scaled and orientated to a supporting development uh, rather than the surrounding neighborhood that connect to the existing public realm in only the most rudimentary way. Communities, on the other hand, are quite well placed to improve public realm because people know the kinds of spaces, uh, th the kinds of things that their neighborhoods need, be it planting or benches or playgrounds, and they know where they need them, principally in the path of their everyday lives. Across the city, community, community groups already improve the public realm in small ways, and they do so by self-organizing, volunteering their time for free, or fundraising, or applying ad hoc for grants in the absence of consistent municipal funding. So how can the state empower communities? How can it formally endorse what communities already do informally? Last year, I was awarded a travel fellowship uh, to look at exactly this. And over the summer, I traveled to New York, Tokyo, and Hong Kong um, to study community-driven public realm with the idea of learning lessons for London. And I thought hard about what of my findings I might suggest today. Um, maybe I could talk about the New York Plaza program, where the city partners with neighborhoods to reclaim streets and turn them into plazas. Uh, nearly 73 plazas in 10 years, which is a successful break from the previous 50-year policy of landowners creating public space in return for floor area that's resulted in over 300 spaces in Manhattan, but just two in Queens. Or I could talk about Tokyo, where one district has created a database of unused private and publicly owned space, which is offered for community use. Or returning to London, should I talk about the recent Making Places competition organised by Walden Forest Council, where residents nominated sites for improvement as diverse as parks, alleys, and the side of a wall, which attracted nearly 300 proposals. Or maybe I could suggest a mashup of all of these initiatives. Or I thought about innovating a form of funding, a special levy on developers to pay for public realm improvements around their schemes, with funds going to community organizations, a kind of special um, public space section 106. With that last one, I really felt I was skirting around the issue and cooking up more convoluted ways for developers to provide things that the state should, in my opinion, provide, and with what caveats. I considered again the people I'd met that were advocating for public space in their neighborhoods, mostly not designers, and doing this advocating in their free time, making posters or laying bays or buying toys or gardening or simply putting their chairs out in the street outside of their regular working life. And I thought about how people who champion public realm issues tend to do other things for the community. And bearing in mind the brief for a radical proposal, it occurred to me at first whimsically, almost like a joke, and then more seriously, that the thing that would really empower communities to deliver public space is a four-day week. Because although it's humbling to speak alongside a panel of exceptional design professionals, um, our backgrounds, which is really the same background, reinforce the idea that public space is a design issue when really it's a societal one. It's an issue of how much of public life we're willing to divest to commercial interests. Or to put it another way, it's an issue of how much of our personal life we're willing to invest into public life and how much we're able to. Fundamentally then, how do we structure our society in a way that encourages community life? A four-day week is how the state can pay for communities to improve public realm. In order to create meaningful space in the city, it can facilitate space in our lives. So coming back to that first image, the current working week is emblematic of the same thing. We're constrained by five days. The remaining two are our private developments, allowing for little connection to anything else. The idea of a five-day week as an organizing principle is actually only about 100 years old, and there's never been a better time to be unshackled from it. With the rise of automation and experiments in universal basic income, and the suggestion that without work, we will lose all meaning in our lives, not to mention the alienating consequences of social media, this is the moment to shift focus from inward to outward, from um, commerce to community. But more than that, a four-day week would create an incentive to improve public space. The journalist Paul Mason wrote in support of more paid holidays. If we win the fight for more paid leisure time, then the creation of new public spaces, from theater foyers to parks to gyms, cafes, beaches, needs to become a social technology, 
not just an afterthought of planning or architecture. A social technology, public space is social infrastructure. Communities already contribute to that social infrastructure, and if we want to empower them, we need state-sanctioned time. Bring on the four-day week. Thank you.